Welcome to today's webinar on elastomeric respirators for U.S. healthcare delivery. Today we will be discussing six key topics and six key speakers will be presenting the information. The first presentation is the overview of respirator regulation, and I am Marianne D'Alessandro, the director of the NIOSH National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory. The NIOSH National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory is responsible for the respirator approval program, including the certification of elastomeric respirators. The Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 established OSHA in the Department of Labor and NIOSH in the Department of Health and Human Services. HHS transferred the Respiratory Protective Device Approval Authority from the Public Health Service to NIOSH at that time. The General Duty Clause made employers responsible for workers' safety and health. OSHA enforces workplace safety and health standards, and NIOSH supports OSHA by performing research, criteria development, and education and training, as well as leading the respirator approval program. The respirator standards, beginning as early as 1920, evolved into the 1969 ANSI Respiratory Protection Standard. The standard was adopted in 1970 by OSHA, and in 1970, the respiratory protective device standards were transferred to NIOSH. OSHA's 1910-134 Respiratory Protection Standard establishes permissible practices for using NIOSH-approved respirators in the workplace. Only when engineering and administrative controls are not feasible or while they are being instituted, Appropriate respirators shall be used pursuant to this section. A respirator is provided to each employee when such equipment is necessary to protect the health of the employee. In addition to the key elements of a respirator program shown here, a NIOSH certified respirator must be used. The employer must also evaluate the effectiveness of its program in protecting its employees. OSHA has assigned protection levels for all classes of respirators. This section applies to all occupational exposure to blood or other potentially infectious materials. As with respiratory hazards, engineering and work practice controls must be used to eliminate or minimize employee exposures. Where occupational exposure remains after the institution of these controls, personal protective equipment, such as an elastomeric respirator, may be used. NIOSH's Respiratory Protective Device Approval Program has safeguarded the approval of worker, the protection of workers for many years. The Respirator Approval Program activities are comprehensive and include evaluation of the engineering design and quality assurance program, as well as testing the devices and post-market evaluation after the approval is in place. Since 1972, NIOSH has approved about 9,000 respirator designs. Typically, the program has approximately 100 manufacturers that are issued a NIOSH certificate of approval with approximately 120 manufacturing sites and located that are located in 20 countries. NIOSH approved self-contained breathing apparatus approved by, used by firefighters, powered air purifying respirators used in many industries, gas masks, chemical cartridge respirators, and particular respirators as well. Essentially, all of the products shown on the left side of the slide are approved by NIOSH. Healthcare workers are most familiar with N95 filtering face piece respirators, and N95 surgical respirators. FDA clears only the surgical N95 that is shown on the right. 
NIOSH approved respirators like the elastomeric respirators that have not undergone FDA clearance have been used in healthcare environments to keep workers safe for many years. NIOSH approved respirators are available in many types, models, and sizes from many manufacturers for a variety of uses. The most common types of respirators in healthcare, again, are N95 filtering face piece respirators. Reusable elastomeric respirators are available that provide the same or greater levels of protection. When used during conventional workplace conditions, the filter cartridge of a reusable elastomeric respirator is not cleaned or disinfected. It is discarded once damaged, soiled, or clogged. Elastomeric respirators are equipped with replaceable filter cartridges of flexible disc or pancake style filters, which are not housed in a cartridge body. As with N95 FFRs, the reusable respirators require a OSHA-approved respiratory protection program, including, but not limited to, initial annual fit testing and user seal checking each time the respirator is used. The Hospital Respiratory Protection Program Toolkit was developed by NIOSH to assist hospitals in developing and implementing effective respiratory protection programs. This toolkit is available on the website and was written as a practical manual that can be used by anyone charged with setting up and maintaining a hospital respiratory protection program. The toolkit identifies existing public health guidance where available on the use of respiratory protection. Scientific evidence is continuously involving particularly with regards to disease transmission. Precautionary use of respiratory protection may be prudent where scientific uncertainty exists. This educational monograph is intended to stimulate greater awareness and knowledge of the importance of effective respiratory protection programs in hospitals, as well as to provide examples of strategies for over overcoming common implementation challenges. The Joint Commission developed this monograph through a research contract with CDC. Now I would like to turn it over to the next speaker, Dr. David Kuhar. Well, controlling exposures to occupational hazards is a fundamental way to protect healthcare personnel. Conventionally, a hierarchy has been used to achieve feasible and effective controls. This hierarchy of controls, in order of most to least effective, includes elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and finally, personal protective equipment, which depends on consistent and correct use. As patients with infectious diseases are cared for in healthcare settings, eliminating the disease or substituting, replacing it with a non-hazardous option is not really possible. Hence, engineering and administrative controls and personal protective equipment are relied upon to reduce exposures. Now, engineering controls, such as maximizing use of physical barriers like glass or plastic windows, can potentially eliminate the need for personal protective equipment use in selected situations. Administrative controls include altering workplace practices and have the potential to reduce exposures. These include strategies such as making ample use of telephone triage and telemedicine to reduce the numbers of patients going to healthcare settings where personal protective equipment might be needed. Now, without going into great detail, the recommended personal protective equipment for caring for patients with known or suspected COVID-19 is a respirator, which is preferred, or face mask if a respirator is unavailable, and a gown, gloves, and eye protection. Next slide, please. To frame the importance of these controls, it's important to understand that there's currently no specific treatment for COVID-19 patients. The primary treatment is supportive care. Further, there's no vaccine currently available for SARS-CoV-2. Hence, we rely heavily on these controls to prevent transmission to healthcare personnel who may be exposed while performing job duties. And we rely on personal protective equipment for our safety during the close interactions with patients that are needed to provide medical care. Personal protective equipment shortages are currently posing a tremendous challenge to our healthcare system. Healthcare facilities are having difficulty 
uh, accessing the needed equipment and are having to identify the safest ways to provide ongoing patient care during the pandemic. There are ongoing efforts across local, state, and federal public health officials, coalitions, and governments to address these shortages. Exploring options to mitigate these personal protective equipment shortages, including respirators, are critical to ensuring provision of a safe workplace and ongoing patient care. I'll now hand things over to the next speaker. Thanks, Dr. Tuhar. So I'm going to give more context as to why the focus of this presentation is elastomeric respirators. Next slide, please. In February 2020, CDC published a web page that provides strategies for healthcare settings to optimize supplies of disposable N95 respirators when there's limited supply, while maximizing the level of protection offered to healthcare personnel. So the web page is intended for leaders who are responsible for developing and, and implementing policies and procedures for preventing infectious disease transmission in healthcare settings. We recommend that healthcare facilities make plans in the event of increased demand and decreased supply of PPE based on the following, an understanding of their current inventory and supply chain, an understanding of their utilization rate, communication with healthcare coalitions and state and local partners, and also discussions with local and state public health and emergency management partners. CDC has framed these strategies within the hierarchy of controls, which Dr. Kuhar described, using the surge capacity approach. So surge capacity refers to the ability to manage sudden unexpected increases in patient volume that would otherwise severely challenge or exceed present capacity of a facility. We thought it would be a useful framework to approach a decreased supply of N95 respirators. Three general strata have been used to describe surge capacity and can be used to prioritize measures to conserve N95 respirator supplies along the continuum of care. Conventional capacity includes measures that do not cause any change in daily standard practices, so things that should already be implemented in infection prevention and control practices around the country. Contingency capacity includes measures that may change daily standard practices, but may not have a significant impact on the care delivered to the patient or the safety of the healthcare personnel. Crisis capacity are measures that are not commensurate with US standards of care. So engineering controls within conventional capacity include things like performing aerosol generating procedures on COVID-19 patients in airborne infection isolation rooms or AIIRs using physical barriers like glass or plastic windows and reception areas, and also properly maintaining ventilation systems. Administrative controls within conventional capacity include things like excluding all healthcare personnel not directly involved in patient care, such as dietary or housekeeping, limiting face-to-face -face healthcare personnel encounters with patients by bundling care activities, excluding visitors to patients with known or suspected COVID-19, Implementing source control. So for example, if a suspected COVID-19 patient's being transferred from the emergency department to the floor, the patient should wear a face mask for source control to minimize the number of healthcare personnel who then have to wear PPE along the route. Another strategy is to implement cohorting of patients and healthcare personnel, or the use of telemedicine, which is being increasingly implemented around the country. It's also important for healthcare personnel to be trained on indications for the use of N95 respirators to minimize waste. And finally, other strategies, including implementing just-in-time fit testing um, and or qualitative fit testing, which actually avoids the destruction of the respirator that, that occurs with the fit testing. So I'm going to finish the, with the respiratory protection under conventional capacity PPE controls. So understanding the different types of N95 respirators is important for conserving supplies. Surgical N95 respirators, as Dr. D'Alessandro mentioned, are recommended for use um, by healthcare personnel who need protection from both airborne and fluid hazards like splashes and sprays. Another important strategy that leads us to the focus of this presentation is the use of alternative NIOSH-approved respirators to N95s. So these are the respirators that provide equivalent or higher protection. There are many disposable filtering face piece respirators that are at least as protective as the N95, N95, including the N, P, and R series. Other alternatives include powered air purifying respirators and elastomeric respirators, which are the focus of this presentation. 
So I wanted to conclude that CDC has also provided contingency and crisis capacity strategies when N95 supplies are, are limited. So these include things like the use of respirators past their manufacturer designated shelf life, extended use, use of international respirators, and limited reuse. However, before healthcare settings even consider these contingency and crisis capacity strategies, other types of NIOSH-approved respirators like elastomerics should be considered first. And now I'll turn it over um, to the next speaker, Dr. Rodanovich. Dr. Lou Rodanovich, uh, also with NIOSH, and I'm going to uh, give a broad overview uh, of elastomeric respirators for U.S. healthcare delivery. So elastomeric half-mask respirators, or EHMRs, are tight-fitting respirators that are made of synthetic or rubber material, permitting them to be repeatedly disinfected, cleaned, and redonned. They are equipped with exchangeable filters, and they may have disposable components. They are marketed in the United States, they are NIOSH approved, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration assigns the same level of protection to them as N95 respirators. Fit testing is required, and the same process is used for N95 respirators. During the use of EHMRs in healthcare since 2014. Here pictured are a number of elastomeric respirators that are currently, or in the past, on the US marketplace. This is not a comprehensive list, but you can see there are a variety of features that become important when they are used in healthcare. Among the more important features of elastomeric respirators, first, there are removable filters, either one or two, pictured here. On the right, you can see there are two filters that are, can be unscrewed uh, when necessary. Importantly, shown here is the particulate filter. This is the device that filters the particulates and prevents them from being inhaled. The elastomeric respirator may also uh, it have a cartridge cover, as shown here, and an exhalation valve, as pictured on the right, including covers. Most elastomeric respirators in the U.S. marketplace come equipped with a P100 filter, although they can also be equipped with an N95 filter. Other characteristics that are important include the type of cover that is over the filter. As shown on the left, you can see there's a hard case around the filter. This may be important when disinfecting the outside surface of the container that encloses the filter. This helps prevent the filter material on the inside of the container from becoming wet. Key benefits of elastomeric respirators, clearly in, in our current situation during shortages, is that they can be reused. However, there are also challenges, and these include a lack of familiarity uh, among the vast majority of US healthcare workers. So training and education becomes very important in this instance. 
They may interfere with communication to some extent, and they may interfere with downward gaze given their relatively large size compared to N95 respirators. They need to be carried by the healthcare worker from room to room when caring for patients during the workday since they are reusable. They need to be stored appropriately between work shifts. And disinfection is key. NIOSH has been engaged in a number of studies involving elastomeric respirators. One was uh, recently published called Project JetFit that uh, the next speaker will address. NIOSH is also in the process of beginning a disinfection study to better understand how best to disinfect elastomeric respirators in uh, healthcare delivery. And in the future, an additional demonstration project will be conducted to understand feasibility of elastomeric respirators in selected clinical settings. There are additional resources shown here for further reading. And now I would like to turn over, uh, I would I'd like to uh, allow the next speaker to talk about an important project that was just completed uh, that was funded by CDC NIOSH. This is Lisa Pompey, and I'm going to provide an overview of the just-in-time elastomeric training and fit testing study, also called JetFit. The purpose of JetFit was to assess the time to achieve fit and training of healthcare workers wearing the elastomeric respirator during a simulated public health emergency. Participants were recruited into this study from two healthcare systems, including Emory Healthcare, as well as the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. The study included a mix of workers, including nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, and others. Prior to inclusion, workers were screened for eligibility and informed consent was obtained. Participants were randomized to wear either the elastomeric respirator or the N95 during jet fit. 124 participants were randomized into elastomeric, while 29 were randomized into the N95 group. For the jet fit, participants engaged in a two hour simulated public health emergency in which they were rapidly trained to use their respirator and fit tested. For the elastomeric group, we then assessed their performance in six key areas, including inspection, donning, positive pressure user seal check, negative pressure user seal check, doffing, and disinfection. For the training, workers watched a nine minute video in which they were trained in these key six areas, including inspection of the elastomeric to understand each component and, to, and how to look for defects within the respirator. They also learned how to correctly put on or don the elastomeric. They learned how to perform user seal checks that assess for satisfactory fit, including the positive pressure user seal check and the negative pressure user seal check. They learned how to correctly take off or doff the elastomeric. And they learned how to disinfect the elastomeric between patient interactions. After the training, fit tests were performed on each participant and time to achieve satisfactory fit was measured. Qualitative fit testing was conducted designed to meet OSHA requirements. For the elastomeric group, participants were assessed for their performance in these six key areas, which included 26 measurements. We assessed these 20, 26 measures three times consecutively to examine change. The trainer scored participants based on the degree of assistance needed, including physical assistance, verbal assistance, or no assistance. We then uh, summed the scores for each of these six key areas 
with an average of three, three within each area and a possible range of 12 to 18 points, possible points, and a total maximum score of 78 points. For the statistical analysis, we examined differences in the number of attempts to pass fit testing between the elastomeric and the N95 groups. We also examined mean differences for fit testing completion between the elastomeric and the N95 group. For the elastomeric group only, we examined performance scores across the three attempts. For our findings, we observed that the number of attempts necessary to identify a respirator with adequate fit was similar for the EH for the elastomeric group versus the N95 group, with the majority only requiring a single attempt to identify a, a respirator with adequate fit. The, average, the time to achieve adequate fit was similar for the elastomeric versus the N95 groups with an average time of six minutes and 30 seconds to complete the fit testing. After training, the total performance score for the elastomeric improved su substantially by the second attempt, but less so for the third attempt. By the second attempt, the average score of 76 was close to the maximum performance score of 78. After training, the performance scores for each of the elastomeric steps improved substantially by the second attempt, again, less so by the third attempt. By the second attempt in each of these areas, the average performance score neared the maximum average score of 3.0. Um, findings from our studies from our study suggests that the elastomeric may ser serve as a suitable alternative to the N95 respirator during public health emergencies. We observe that the healthcare personnel can be rapidly fit tested and trained, that the elastomeric fit testing took no longer to conduct than the N95 respirator. Workers quickly demonstrated that they could carry out the six key tasks required for elastomeric use. Additional NIOSH CDC sponsored studies are underway or planned, including the assessment of the elastomeric disinfection process, as well as the feasibility of using the elastomeric in patient care. I will now turn this over to the next speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Stella Hines, and I am a physician in the divisions of occupational and environmental medicine and pulmonary and critical care at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. And I will be talking to you about our experience with the use of reusable elastomeric respirators, as well as reviewing what the current evidence base is reflecting on disinfection and cleaning. Okay. So the University of Maryland Baltimore campus has used elastomeric respirators since 2009 due to N95 respirator shortages. And at that time, the safety director was familiar with elastomeric respirator use from general industry and saw them as reliable. So these were assigned to hospital workers in certain units that were deemed to be considered higher risk as well as to workers in the ambulatory practices. And use of elastomerics as a regular uh, part of uh, respiratory protection continued in the hospital through probably late 2016 when people were transitioned more towards N95s. But even then, at least a quarter of the employees that were using elastomerics wished to remain in these devices. And these devices have been the ongoing source of respiratory protection for the ambulatory workers since that time. So we used the 3M 7500 series elastomeric respirator, which comes in three different size face masks, as well as the 3M P100 particulate cartridge covered filters, which are cleanable. So looking back on this time, as of the summer of 2014, 
Our system in the downtown Baltimore campus had over 2,000 workers wearing tight-fitting respirators, the majority of whom were using elastomeric respirators. So this provided a great opportunity for us to try to understand um, some research questions in this population. And so between 2015 and 2016, we performed a study using key informant interviews, focus groups, and electronic surveys to try to really understand are elastomeric respirators an acceptable and feasible alternative to address N95 respirator shortages in healthcare. We ended up having 1,152 total respondents of whom 432 were active elastomeric respirator users. So what we found is that user acceptance is not a critical barrier to elastomeric respirator use. What we did see was storage and assuring availability are significant barriers to expected use. What we saw was that among some of the healthcare workers, particularly mobile workers like doctors and respiratory therapists, they would often report not having the respirator available to them, and this would lead to use of an unassigned respirator like an N95. So storage and assuring availability is extremely important. Disinfection, we found, was not a barrier to expected use and use of assigned respirator, but we did see inadequate compliance with expected cleaning practices when these practices were completely left to the individual. And we believe that this practice probably can be taught and that strategies to centralize cleaning would bypass this in some way. Let's discuss what options exist or at least have been published to address some of these potential barriers. So the first is that of storage and availability. So there are two main ways to address these topics. One is to use a central cache of respirators and the other is to rely on individual maintenance. So at the Texas Center for Infectious Disease, which uh, treats patients with tuberculosis, they routinely use elastomeric respirators as a form of respiratory protection where the workers are given backpacks in which they put their respirator and have it readily available throughout the day. And this has been a successful practice. In a Canadian trial where they were piloting use of elastomeric respirators in um, a medical intensive care unit, um, there the plan was for these respirators to be centrally cleaned. Um, that study demonstrated um, failure of this strategy because there had not been staff dedicated to actually take the respirators down to the central cleaning location and to pick them up and bring them back to the unit after they had been cleaned. And so I think the take home message from both of these strategies is, A, if you are using a central cache of respirators, you must identify staff in advance and assure that those job duties are clear on who is performing what task with respect to transport, cleaning and return of the respirators. And if the strategy is geared towards individual maintenance, then providing a means of readiness, such as a backpack, um, makes sense in assuring that workers have the respirator when they need it, particularly mobile workers who are not confined to a single unit or a single patient area. So cleaning and disinfection options are critical, particularly in our current time with COVID-19. So just some uh, vocabulary. So cleaning refers to removal of soiling agents like dirt, or in our case, facial contaminants like facial oils. Whereas disinfection refers to removal of microbial agents, particularly virus. So there have been three published studies about this topic with elastomeric respirators that we will discuss 
one report to the FDA. And again, considering cleaning and disinfection options, the strategies can be individually based or centrally based, as we talked about with the storage protocols. So one paper that has come out to describe disinfection strategies was published in 2015 in the American Journal of Infection Control by Bessesen and colleagues. And in this study, they developed an elastomeric respirator cleaning and disinfection standardized operating procedure. And basically, they first um, took manufacturer SOPs and asked healthcare workers to clean the respirators according to the manufacturer instructions. And when they first did that, healthcare workers made 47% of total errors doing this. But after iteratively refining this cleaning and disinfection protocol, they were able to reduce healthcare workers down to zero errors following this simple protocol. So the protocol required having available a sink with available warm water, two buckets, one that would be used to place detergent, a second that would be used to place a chemical disinfectant and they use dilute bleach solution. They needed tongs because the respirators were to be submerged in the fluids and these face masks like to float. So the tongs need to submer need to keep the respirators in the water. And they used disinfectant wipes for the filters. The total amount of time it took to complete this process took between 16 and 23 minutes. And this study included no microbial testing, but that's coming. So the next two slides, these are just snapshots of what the study produced as a tool that could be used for this cleaning and disinfection. And it was meant to be printed out and laminated so that on one page you see what supplies you need before you can clean the respirator. And on the second page, it actually gave a step-by-step -step, um, instruction to the user to be able to complete the process. So, and again, the healthcare workers were able to complete this with zero errors by following this simple protocol. So what do we know about uh, microbial um, removal from respirators? So um, Lawrence and colleagues um, studied this and published this then again in American Journal of Infection Control in 2017, really trying to figure out if you had to clean a respirator with soap alone or whether you needed to have uh, cleaning and disinfection with a chemical disinfectant. So they tested five different elastomeric models that had been contaminated with both influenza virus as well as artificial sebum. And they compared outcomes among respirators that had just been cleaned with detergent versus those that had been cleaned and disinfected with a bleach chemical disinfectant. And the outcomes they looked at were based on um, TCID50 assays, which is meant to give an assessment of the presence of viable or potentially infectious virus. Um, and they saw no significant differences in the TCID50 results among respirators that had been only cleaned with detergent versus those that had been cleaned and disinfected. And importantly, virus was completely eliminated from all services except for the fabric straps on two models. But they have later evidence to suggest that they were able to achieve a significant reduction in virus presence on the fabric straps. So in this study, which was a laboratory-based study, um, they performed their cleaning and disinfection protocols in a class one biological safety cabinet. First, they removed the filter cartridges. They um, put the respirators in the face masks in a bucket that was filled with 0.5% neutral wash detergent and gently cleaned the respirators with a sponge. Then they placed the respirators in a bucket with a dilute bleach solution and then rinsed the respirators. The cartridges, which you cannot submerge in water, were wiped with a super sani cloth disinfectant wipe and were allowed to have a contact time of two minutes. 
This process took approximately 21 minutes and they described that the drying time for the elastomeric body took about 20 minutes. However, it took about six hours for the straps to completely dry. So the take home from this Lawrence study are that cleaning gets virus off just as well as cleaning and disinfection in this study where influenza was, was tested. The fabric straps may be an inconsistency for virus removal, but again, this subsequent study demonstrated reliable log reduction from the straps and that drying time on the elastomeric respirators is limited by the fabric straps. So what about disinfectant type? So in a study by Subash and colleagues in 2014, they took 40 elastomeric respirators and inoculated them with influenza virus and then wiped them with three different types of disinfectant wipes. What they saw was that for influenza, isopropyl did not completely eliminate live virus, but the cavi wipe and dispatch both did. And in that study, they did not test on the straps or the cartridges. So I think that's important as we consider the types of disinfectants that may be relevant for COVID-19. So um, we recently have been involved in research um, on this topic with use of a hybrid PAPR elastomeric product called the Clean Space Halo Respirator. And in this respirator, there's a face mask that is silicone based and it looks similar to what you see with an elastomeric respirator. Um, it would be very simple if all you had to do in a hospital setting was wipe down that face mask with a disinfectant wipe and you didn't have to include that cleaning step with soap and water. So this is what we tested. And um, we looked at this from two aspects, removal of facial contaminants as well as removal from virus. And for the facial contaminant testing, um, we were able to transfer a fluorescent lotion similar to what would be present in facial cosmetics and similar to facial oil from people's face to the face mask and look at it under fluorescent light. And then after the masks were cleaned and disinfected or just disinfected, we looked at the masks again to see if all the fluorescent particle was removed. And what we saw was that on the mask that had only been wiped with disinfectant, the fluorescent lotion was not completely removed. So from a facial contaminant standpoint, we do think you need to include a step for, that includes cleaning with soap and water. As far as van viral contaminants, the answer to that is we think yes at some interval. So here's what we did. So again, we use the Clean Space Halo product, which you can see in the picture on the right, and the face mask on that is silicone based and looks like an elastomeric face mask. We took uh, these respirators and contaminated them with influenza via spray. And then we um, took all the respirators and um, Half of them were cleaned in the Bessesen soap and water protocol, and the other half um, were just disinfected with disinfectant wipes. And the cleaned ones were also disinfectant with disinfectant wipes. The wipe process, it was a four separate wipe protocol where one wipe was used to cover the entire exterior surface of the face mask. A second wipe was used to clean the interior surface of the face mask. A third wipe was used to clean the harness and the straps. And then a fourth wipe was used to clean the power unit. And we tested four different disinfectants. And overall, what we saw across all of the disinfectants was that there was better reduction to undetectable viral levels if you also performed cleaning with soap and water. And this is not out in the public domain yet, but hopefully this will be published soon. It's under review. What about filter cartridge cleaning and disinfection? So Applied Research Associates had 2019 report evaluated this topic and they studied 3M covered P100 filter cartridges. And here, all of these cartridges were wiped 
with a sponge soaked in 0.5% neutral wash, and then half of the rest of these cartridges were also wiped with a sani cloth. They, they had previously been contaminated with influenza. All of the cartridges had significant reductions in influenza contamination with no significant difference uh, between those that had just been cleaned versus those that had been cleaned and disinfected. And even more importantly, all of the 3MP100 filters passed penetration tests, demonstrating that the filter still works. And they, this was demonstrated even after 150 cycles of cleaning. So I think this is very important information. So what about automated cleaning? This would be very helpful. So there are limits on the upper temperatures that these elastomeric respirators can tolerate. So ARA studied this with five elastomeric models that were contaminated with influenza. And they used a traditional hospital washer disinfector. But importantly, they performed this cleaning at a temperature of 50 centigrade or 122 Fahrenheit. And normally these machines operate at temperatures greater than 90 centigrade. What they studied was a Miel G7899 washer disinfector. And again, they demonstrated no detectable viable virus on the elastomeric respirators that had been cleaned in this automated way. And as far as durability, these respirators passed all of the durability tests in four out of the five models that were tested that had been cleaned and disinfected up to 100 cycles in this disinfector. So in summary for the cleaning and disinfection data, there is an evidence base that exists for designing hospital protocols here. Thinking about disinfection, this could very easily happen on wards, but a soap and water protocol probably needs to be done centrally. And I think the key thing here is that there needs to be dedicated staff to perform the cleaning as well as assigned people to pick up and drop off the respirators. And importantly, elastomeric respirators maintain their integrity after repeated cleaning and disinfection, including automated cleaning in a washer disinfector at 50 centigrade. So what about filter change out schedule? In general industry, the decision to change out filters is based on exposure limits, the concentration of the toxin, cartridge performance data. And so these principles are kind of hard to apply to infectious agents. In general, the filter needs to be changed when it becomes soiled or damaged, or it becomes hard to breathe through. So what about microbial persistence on filters? Filters in general are made of polypropylene and are usually covered by non-porous cartridges, hard cartridges. Now viruses can persist on filters, but there are significant reductions in viability over time. What about filter penetration? So I think the best evidence on this um, has come out of Gardner et al. from 2013, where they studied viable MS2 virus, which is often used to um, simulate respiratory protection studies. This virus is 20 nanometers in size, but when it's alive, agglomerates to 500 nanometers. And they tested N95 and P100 filters at cyclic versus constant flow rates up to a 270 liter per minute flow rate. And even at that extremely high flow rate, on those P100 filters, the penetration of the viable MS2 virus was less than 0.3%. So I think the take home message on filter change out for now is that it's not clear how frequently to change these filters when there's no obvious soiling and no increase in difficulty breathing. There is um, a video by the University of Nebraska Medical Center's HEROES program where they look at elastomeric respirators and the guidance there is to change these filters every three months, but I think we actually don't know how long you can go with that. Um, with P100 filters, 
What we do know is that live MS2 virus does not penetrate these filters even at high flow rates. So what are we doing with COVID-19? So in our ambulatory practices, elastomeric respirators are still the main form of respiratory protection. And those outpatient workers are fit tested every year and have their own respirators. In the hospital, elastomeric respirators are part of the pandemic PPE plan. We are disinfecting these respirators with that four wipe protocol after each use and we are using end of shift centralized cleaning according to the Bessesen protocol and using a shared supply of respirators. So I have included some key references here um, that are available um, in the public domain or on PubMed. The findings and conclusions in this presentation represent the opinions of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the University of Texas Houston, Emory University, or the University of Maryland. Mention of products do not imply endorsement. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you for listening.